Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to yet another Horus Heresy Lord Breakdown. The Vengeful Spirit. This is their return to good old-fashioned action-y form for the Horus Heresy, which has been a little bit bogged down for a few books here, but before we get into the 29th book in the Horus Heresy series, today's sponsor is NordVPN. And honestly, do I even have to tell you why you should be using a VPN in this day and age? Hell, Google is the least of your problems, and they already know more about you than your biological parents at this point. They read your email, they stalk your social media, they keep constant tabs on where you are in the world and what you're browsing for and searching for. They also never forget. I bought myself a treadmill two years ago to try and slim down my overweight ass, and I'm still getting ads for treadmills. And I'm sorry to break it to all of the myriad treadmill manufacturers out there, but I strongly doubt that buying a second treadmill and running on two simultaneously will increase my already abysmal workout efficiency. But that just the funny part of it. Getting bombarded with ads for a specific product is part and parcel of living on today's internet. What is considerably less funny is what happened to me just a few months ago when my YouTube account got hacked. Oh, that was hilarious, let me tell you. And I wish I had had NordVPN installed then as I do now. Because it turns out, just thinking that it's never actually going to happen to you is not necessarily the best defensive strategy. And even more so in an age where you don't have to be a YouTuber to get your identity stolen on the internet. Identity theft is an... A stolen on the internet. Identity theft is a no joke and it is an absolute hell to get sorted out. So, if you are at all worried about your online security, or simply don't want Big Brother looking over your shoulder, do consider going down into the description below and clicking on the NordVPN link. That should guide you to a site where you can pick up a two-year plan plus four additional months for free for a little over three bucks per month, with the coupon code ARCH. And now... On to the Horus Heresy. The Vengeful Spirit, book number 29 by Graham McNeil. This one I really like. It's a return to more large scale action, particularly compared to the previous ones, and we get to reunite with Garvir Loken. <sighs> On the one hand, I really despise the whole dead character. Totally isn't dead, but he's kind of gone batshit insane thing, and now he's fine again. Though, to be fair, a little bit of the mental trauma does linger, thankfully. But in the case of Garvia Loken, I can make an exception, because... You know, basically, he shouldn't have been killed, quote-unquote, in the first place. As his relationship with the Vengeful Spirit, with the Legion and Horus, makes for a really interesting story here. It's kind of like that goddamn reflection cracked thing, where you can see the outlines of a much better story never to appear because the writers were like, no, 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 we can't have that. That would be far too interesting. Anywho, our story today begins on Dwell, the world that we saw invaded in that little short story a while ago where little Horus got his face shaved off. Which, again, damn, that's, that's a neat cut right there. They've reattached it, but it's not quite right. And the reason why it has been invaded is now fully revealed. Apparently, it is a repository of, literally, dead knowledge. As the wise old elders of Dwell, and some Imperial servants as well, have been turned into a database of the deceased. Which is quite the concept, I will admit. And Horus believes that this um, 
a repository of knowledge, will grant him the information he needs to kill the Emperor, the greatest god to have ever lived, as we are told in the prologue. The whole Emperor as a god thing, that will need a longer rant at some point, but let's ignore that point for now, as we are introduced to the two newest members of the Mournival, Noctua and Kyber. Uh, which already demonstrates the degradation of the Mornewal. Abaddon immediately simply just appoints his second in command, basically, leaving Aximan to be like, okay, right, um, how do I balance this shit out? And does his best by selecting, again, Noctua, a far more, um, pragmatic kind of personality in comparison to the Widowmaker's rather more aggressive style. But the fresh paint job uh, fixed to the Mournival is hardly the main point here. The main point is, of course, the great mausoleum containing the knowledge of the dead, and Horus is already busy pilfering away at it. Aximand points out that the dwellers would have been far better off simply blasting the entire thing to smithereens and allowing it to be captured, and <laughs> frankly, I'm kind of like, why didn't they? Intelligence, particularly highly important intelligence, and of this wide and broader scope, is usually the first things you burn, when there's even the faintest possibility that it could be captured by the enemy. And yet here, despite being led by the Iron Hand Medusan, who is talked up quite a bit as some brilliant mastermind, they didn't do that? Huh. It's a bit weird, isn't it? Though... You can make an argument, because Medusa would have absolutely no goddamn way of knowing just how precious this information is, particularly not the very specific tidbit that Horus is looking for, and the five white scars that almost killed Horus Aximand, the trap for Horus, well, there is every possibility that that was simply just a ruse, a feint, a distraction intended to try and tell the Sons of Horus that, oh, oh, I've played my hand, you're safe now. It's not like I'm going to be bringing a small fleet of gunships to bear anytime soon. But we'll get to that a little bit later. Anywho, that is probably the most likely explanation for why the repository wasn't actually outright destroyed, though even then a little bit of uh, heavy-handed sabotage may have been useful. Since beyond some battle damage, the repository remains almost entirely intact, and it doesn't take very long at all for Horus to restore it to full functionality after he encouraged the tech adept with a few well-timed and public executions, of course. The Dwellers, the Ancient Ones, have told him that to defeat the Emperor, who is a god apparently, Horus too must become a god, and he needs to follow in the Emperor's footsteps to do this. To aid him in this great undertaking, he has summoned two of his brothers, Fulgrim and Mortarion, who have both made really a good time here. <laughs> I mean, last we saw uh, Mortarion, he had just fought the Khan, of course, near Prospero. And Fulgrim was literally in the warp, so, um, uh, you know, good job. Then again, the timeline of the Horus Heresy, much like the timeline of any GW property, is, um, pliant at the best of times. So. And Fulgrim has, of course, at this point already turned into a full form scaly, causing Mortarion to stare at him with absolute disgust. As is only right and proper, of course. Fulgrim also reveals that uh, Petarabo might be inconvenience for a rather lengthy period of time. Though when Horus asked him if he killed him, Fulgrim says that, oh no, I, told, I let him live. <laughs> I didn't try to eat all of his strength or anything. No, 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 no. <laughs> this was entirely Kekakidori. Everything as planned. Worry not, little Horus. <sighs> 
Yeah, that, that makes you trust him, doesn't it? Oh, I almost killed one of your value generals, by the way, but I need you now more than ever, yadi yadi yadi. Fulgrim is necessary, after all, so I guess Horus can't do much but entertain his ridiculous notions. Though he does ask him if the creature that had been inhabiting his flesh was fully gone now. Which it is, because, you know, Fulgrim just kind of removed that when he felt like he didn't need it anymore. <sighs> Let's not even get into that whole nonsense, shall we? Horus has a grand plan for his two brothers, and he could not possibly do it without them. He uh, lathers them up quite heavily. Oh, you are very, very important to me. Oh, no, no, you're not my servants or anything. You're just my subordinates. <laughs> Equal subordinates, mind you. I wear the title as war master not to lord it over you and order you around like little peasants. No, no, no. Merely to remind us of the task at hand. <laughs> I'm sure that's all entirely on the level, no doubt about it. So, what exactly is this great plan then? Well, it begins with piecing together a memory that isn't there. Now that's an extraordinarily curious thing for a Primarch, and it is what Horus first became aware of. He, how do I put it? He started noticing holes in his memories, open blank areas, uh, slots where there should have been something, and he knows there should have been something there. He even has a vague idea of what it should have been, but he can't actually remember or recall it. Not that he can't recall the details or the specifics, not even that it is completely forgotten, it's as if there's a hazy patch in his memories which should be a literal impossibility, as all Primarchs have 100% perfect recall of everything they have ever done, seen, or experienced. Fulgrim asks him, and points this out, that this is ridiculous, brother. We are Primarchs, we have Edictic memories. Edictic? Edictic? I can't pronounce that goddamn word for some reason. Perfect recall. You can't have forgotten anything. And so Horus asks him, Do you remember every battle you fought? Fulgrim says, Yes. Every slash of the sword, every shot, every maneuver, all of it, every warrior. And so Horus asks, Then tell me of Moloch. And Fulgrim has no answer. Even though, again, he does remember it, or at the very least, parts of it. He was there, Horus was there, as was Jagatai and the lion as well. Quite a force. Now, bearing in mind this was before many of these legions were strong enough to operate on their own, so it's not like there were four legions here, but four Primarchs and the Emperor? Holy hell, as Mortarion points out, that is an overwhelming amount of military force, and he asks if heavy resistance was expected, and... No. <laughs> the planet was expected to surrender upon first contact, as they were apparently fanatical record keepers and remembered terror. It seemed inconceivable that they would offer any sort of resistance when the Emperor landed on the planet and said, Hey, I'm from Earth. Want to be friends? And yet still he brought all of this military might to pacify a planet that didn't need pacification. Hmm. Weird indeed. And stranger still, they stayed there on an unresisting planet for 111 days, and when they left, they had garrisoned it with a hundred regiments of the Imperial Army and three Titan cohorts. Aha. Uh -huh. I'm starting to see why Horus finds all of this mighty suspicious. Furthermore, the Emperor had not completely removed the Primarch's memories. He had, um, as Horus put it, lessened some, enhanced others to try and hide what he had done on Moloch. 
rather than outright remove all of it. But from the various hints that Horus had managed to piece together, he came to the conclusion that Dwell was the place to be, because the earliest settlers of Dwell were apparently from Moloch. But not from the Imperial version of Moloch, rather that they came from a Moloch before the Imperium. They were the original settlers of that place, and they somehow recalled the Emperor's first arrival. Yes, indeed. First arrival. Apparently, Moloch was visited by the Emperor to do something in a starship. And when he left, he didn't need a starship anymore. Aha. Uh -huh. Once again, I can start to see why Horus got awfully suspicious by all of this. Uh, he assumes that whatever the Emperor found there, it turned him into a god capable of space traveling simply by clapping his goddamn hands, apparently. And whatever it was, it must still be there because the Emperor left behind an incredible amount of guards. It's starting to make an awful lot of sense, frankly, but before Horus can continue to explain, several fire raptors appears outside the dome and starts cycling up their automatic cannons. Yes. Medusa's little ploy has been sprung properly, and the dome of revivification fills with high explosive ammunition. As good a place as any to skip on over to another scene, I think. Markador and Lehman Ross is playing a game of Hrathnuckle, deep within the Imperial Palace, discussing various things in relation to the war. Discussing murder, strategy, revenge, and many other things. Lehman Ross apparently made it out from the Alpha Legion ambush, after all. He mentions that the Angel arrived, the Dark Angels of Caliban came, just in time to save him from the Alpha Legion. Hmm. Ross isn't particularly happy with this, but he also admits that, yep, he was pretty boned up until the Angels arrived, so uh, he can't really whinge too insistently, really. His fleet, too, survived, albeit battered to all hell. His capital ship, the one he plunged right into the heart of the Alpha Legion formation, on the hope that Alpharius himself might show, has taken the worst of it. Though she is a tough old girl, and Russ is convinced that she will fight yet again, despite her hurts. And Russ's idea is, of course, to immediately take his fleet as swiftly as possible and race on out into the galaxy to face off against Horus. Somewhat unsurprising, I do imagine, though Malkador and Dawn both ask that he perhaps consider doing something else. Dawn's a little bit too prideful to ask outright, but Malkador has no such qualms and asks Russ to entrench himself on terror to discourage any assaults made by Horus, but Russ unsurprisingly refuses, stating that he does not do his best warring from behind a wall. Now, I might argue that there are very few warriors in the galaxy that aren't benefited by a massive curtain wall, but details, details. A far more immediate concern is Malkador's current gambit which includes Garviel Loken and Malkador's newly formed band of knights. Russ is not at all convinced of putting Garviel in charge of this, though. He points out, and correctly so, that when Garviel Loken was relocated, he was little more than a murder-maddened savage monster that had to be beaten back into shape. Malkador retorts by saying that the fact that he survived at all was a miracle. <laughs> well, I would argue plot, but tomato, tomato. And so Ross has summoned Garvir Loken to come and have a few games of Hrafnuckle with him, so that he may judge his character, and whether or not upon returning to the Warmaster's ship, 
Yep, that's their plan. Garville might decide to return to his brothers. Not an unreasonable thing to wonder. Horus turned the overwhelming majority of his legion from loyal to traitors just by the force of his word and the charisma of his character. Sending a spy into his legion, you best make damn sure that he's properly motivated. And for the task at hand, only the most zealous would ever possibly do. Garviel Loken was to be tasked with infiltrating the vengeful spirit, placing locator beacons along the length of the chip that would then guide in space wolf boarding parties, and of course, Russ himself, to board the warship and to kill Horus in single combat. Or, well, preferably maybe surround him by wolves and then blast him apart with bolt of fire, mayhaps. I doubt at this point Russ would be quite so mm, honourable about it, frankly. That was a lot to ask of Garvia Logan, and no doubt about it, but he was also pretty much the only actual option. And after playing a few games of Hrafnuckle with him and receiving some sass from Logan, Russ figures, well, he can sass me. He's probably good enough for the job. <sighs> Only the best for Lehman Russ. When what he should have been doing instead is sending a horde of fire raptors to simply shoot Horus. As now we can return to Medusa's assassination attempt, which really actually seems to be doing pretty goddamn well. The first words that escapes Horus' lips, or uh, more correctly, the first words he thinks when he comes to after having been knocked unconscious is, I should be dead. <laughs> and yes, he should be. Only Fulgrim's bullshit, psychic nonsense, hibbity doobity dooba doo doo da, actually saved him, as he is able to raise some sort of force field to rob the thousands upon thousands of high explosive bullets of their killing force. He does this for just long enough for Mortarion, who is also heavily wounded, and Horus, equally heavily wounded, to get up and grapple the gunships, jump on top of the gunships, and of course then kill gunships with hammer. <laughs> kill gunship with hammer. <laughs> I do love this scene because it's one of the most 40k scenes I have read in a very long time. How do you take care of a bloody gunship spitting out tens of thousands of rounds at you from twin rotor cannons? You bind it with the chain, you leap on top of it, and then you smash it apart with a heavy thing. <laughs> that is absolutely excellent shit right there. And after surviving the assassination attempt, Horus is more determined than ever to carry out his plans and bring with him his brothers to Moloch, where we run into another of our main characters as well, Raven Divine, one of the sons of Moloch's ruling imperial caste. In fact, his father, Cyprian Divine, is also out on a hunt with his son right now, as they're chasing down a Malahagra creature. Apparently, Moloch is <laughs> down near a death world, frankly, as the Malahagras are said to stand seven meters tall and can tear an imperial knight in half. Right here then, and uh, this is but one of the world's many, many, many horrific beasties. Jesus Christ. It uh, definitely does sound like a world that might contain a certain portal to a certain naughty place, that's for damn sure. And Raven is of course mounted in a knight, otherwise he would have been... Um, Nothing more than a light snack, I suppose, to the creature that he is supposedly hunting. 
And he is not alone either, of course. His father, Cyprian Divine, piloting another knight, is with him, along with a series of seneschals and outriders, supposedly trying to chase the beast into the open, I guess, as he refers to them as beaters. I suppose, you know, a couple of guns that might piss it off enough to move out of the way. But the first creature they come across is no threat to anyone. It is a dead juvenile male, apparently covered with bullet wounds, interestingly enough. The two come to the agreement that something weird has clearly happened here, but Cyprian heads off before his son can really come to a firm conclusion. It is also made quite clear that there is very little love lost between the two, Raven spending most of his days uh, just really hoping and praying that the old bastard will fall over dead already. <laughs> Which is... Uh, I mean, I suppose, I guess. See, this is one of those things that have always kind of confused me in the way. Uh, you would think that families would have a certain bond to one another, but it really does not seem to be the case in these mighty ones, is it? I do suppose the old saying is true, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Anywho, Raven is not particularly fond of his father, and any feelings of a positive nature he may once have had have long since been taken care of by the administrations of his sister. It was also his wife, incidentally, Lix, who was part of the Serpent God's Cult. Which includes such fascinating rituals as getting shit-faced drunk and drugged out of your mind, and then engaging in masked orgies. Right. I, s I see where this is going. I see where this is going indeed. Raven is uh, already a rather lost soul, as it turns out. But anywho... His father happens across the other Malahagra, except it is not the first's mate, as they had assumed, instead it is its mother. And it is apparently the largest Malhagra any of them have ever seen, standing a full 10 meters tall. That's... that's pretty ridiculous. That is pretty actually genuinely ridiculous. To put it into a little bit of uh, perspective here, the Statue of Liberty, the upper actual statue part, is, uh, what was it, 45 meters tall or something like that? The Malahagra is a little under a fourth of the height of the Statue of Liberty. Yeah. Chunky mama, and no doubt about it. And she's got Raven's father on the defensive. Hellblade has been battered to the ground and Cyprian Divine is breathing heavily as Raven storms into the battle and engages the monster. And he's got it on the back foot as well, seemingly just about to deliver the finishing blow when dear old dad comes back in the fight and guts the creature from behind with his revving chain blade. And something within Raven just snaps. See, I really kind of like this scene because it's so obvious what's going to happen, yet it is executed very well as Raven goes like that. Kill was mine, and his dad is like, Don't be a silly willy boy. A right of first kill was always mine. <laughs> Besides, who actually killed it, me or you? <laughs> to which Raven rather wittily responds, And who are they going to say killed you, the Malagra or me? As he kicks the old man along with the knight off a cliff. <laughs> I like that one too. I really like that one too. Again, it's pretty obvious what's coming, and yet, well executed. Well executed. But we've got to take a little break from the interesting things and wander over to Horus instead, who is busy recuperating from having almost, but not quite, been killed. Something that... Abaddon apparently took quite personally, as he is now, um, as little Horus puts it, about ready to fall on his sword for letting um, 
Horus be so gravely injured, whereas many others in the Legion are trying to figure out how the hell three fire raptors were kept secreted on the planet as the Legion had supposedly secured it. Good question. Horus somewhat dismisses the question entirely and basically just says that it must have been some kind of Dark Age tech that Medusa no doubt had salvaged from Medusa. Interesting that. Dark Age tech on Medusa. There was another suggestion earlier as well. Was that in the... Um, that was in the previous book, wasn't it? When... Um, God damn it! What was his name? The White Scar Storm Seer uh, pointed out that how are my arts any different from your mechanical arts? What are the secrets really going on on Medusa? Oh. <laughs> A lovely little tease there, but anywho, Horus dismisses the fact that this was Abaddon's fault in any way and simply says that he was the one that dismissed the Justerians, and yeah, he would do that, wouldn't he? Like, oh, I don't need bodyguards, pushing in the distance, as uh, auto cannons cycle up to fire, yes. See, that is kind of the problem, isn't it? No matter how big and strong you may be, bodyguards could still be rather useful, frankly, but... Oh well, details. He then guides Little Horus in, oh actually before that, uh, Little Horus makes the report that the sons of Horus went absolutely goddamn nuts after hearing about the assassination attempt on their Primarch and how close it came to putting the little bastard down, and apparently ran completely amok, leveling the entire city, including the Morsolitica. That is an act that Horus is not overly happy with, as he points out that there was a lot of knowledge that could still have been gleaned from it. No doubt about it. Perhaps even some knowledge that might have had him change his course as well. Hmm. Or more information about what exactly was on the planet, and perhaps even some information about its quote-unquote guardians, since it does have some just... Not perhaps quite as effective guardians as you might think, considering, again, the value of the objective, but we'll get to that again later. Uh, Horus then guides little Horus Aximand. That's gonna get really. Aximand. Let's just call him that, right? Horus guides Aximand into a room with the Cruor Angelis, the Blood Angel Apothecary that was, um,. Occupied by the demonic entity in the Blood Angels novel. Poor bastard, really. Anywho, Aximand is given a cloth bundle, and he guesses immediately what is inside of it. Mourn it all. Horus has restored Aximand's weapon after it was shattered by the Medusan blade wielded by the White Scar's assassins. And there is an interesting mention here that when Aximan grips it, he senses a lethality in it that has nothing to do with its powered edge. Now this may very well simply just be uh, basically that he's like, oh this is my weapon, you know, I know this weapon, therefore it is extra lethal in my hands, but well, he was handed this weapon in front of the Cruor Angelis. Hmm. And Horus was the one to restore it, especially rather than Aximand. Could it be? Could it be that a few additional changes have been made to the weapon? Would Horus really give one of his favoured sons a demon enchanted blade? I feel like I'm leaping to conclusions here, but they are delicious conclusions, aren't they? Equally delicious is the conclusions being made by the Ultramarines on Moloch, as they are basically saying that, oh yes, we are indeed rather bold, are we not? And this is before they receive the news that the Whoremaster is indeed... Whoremaster? <laughs> Whoremaster. Yes, yes. One of the Ultramarines call him the Whoreson Whoremaster, and I think Whoremaster is a pretty good title for him, to be entirely honest with you. Anywho, the news is that the Whoremaster is indeed on the way to Moloch, and the Ultramarines think that despite all of the Imperial Army personnel on the planet, some 50 million men, apparently, which, holy shit, that's the first time I think I've heard 40k overshoot 
military numbers. Usually you have ridiculous ideas like a few dozen regiments attacking an entire planet, but 50 million soldiers. That's a world conquering force right there, no doubt about it. But beyond these, there are only three companies of ultramarines. And they estimate that the Blood Angels, who are also on the planet, number less than half their number again. And if, well, the Hallmaster arrives, then it is only Legion forces who are going to be able to stop him. And as we are going to see, of course, that will turn out to not be an entirely unreasonable estimate. One that Garvia Loken also has to deal with as he's trying to create a team for the infiltration of the Vengeful Spirit. One of the people he was sent to find, or more correctly, Malkador simply told him that, oh no, no, this guy will totally help. Not quite so easy. Was a... Not Sons of Horus, a lunar wolf by the name of Severin. Apparently an expert of infiltration and stealth, he tries to test Loken by seeing if he can find him. Which Garvia Loken can't until he just gives up on the matter and starts walking back to his transport. And then he uses the transport weapons to locate and find the would-be stealth assassin. Ever. Severin then fades away into nothingness, saying that he had expected more of Loken, which Loken doubts, and again, reasonable estimate. The guy seems entirely convinced that it's a complete suicide run, and he kind of doesn't want to get killed. Weird, that. And on the topic of strange things, um, we pop on back to the Imperial Garrison, I suppose we should call them, of Moloch. This time, the Blood Sworn, the Blood Angels Band, um, that are apparently tasked with guarding Moloch due to ancient treaties, though in considerably smaller numbers than the Ultramarines. Hmm, interesting. I wonder who exactly came up with the uh, the ratio of warriors to be sent to this world, and the necessity of them. Apparently it was something done by Sanguinius himself, it is suggested, so clearly whoever came up with this was pretty damn far up the food chain. Quite possibly even the Emperor himself. It is mentioned that this is not at all intended to be some sort of punishment detail, but this particular band is kind of seeing it as such, as they are denied the opportunity to fight the hated Nephilim. <laughs> well, they uh, might end up actually being quite happy for being denied that opportunity, but, uh, well... That is a separate issue entirely. And this little band has already had a very close and personal encounter with the Black Rage and the Red Thirst. Though this is something that will only be revealed quite a bit later on in the, uh, the book. It's not really a plot point per se, so I figured we'd abre 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 it. Abress it, that's a new word for you. Address uh, it, pretty much right off the bat. Uh, basically, the squad under the leader's command ended up slaughtering a group of Imperial Army personnel, and they don't know what the hell happened. Hmm. Now that's quite interesting, because of course, normally when Blood Angels are afflicted with their uh, gene seed sickness, it's pretty... Strident. Uh, there doesn't seem to tend to be a whole lot of chance to uh, realize that what you did was wrong. You might simply just fall completely and utterly right then and there. But in this case, there was apparently the opportunity for them to get back to their senses. Far from impossible, mind you. It absolutely does happen. It's just relatively rare and, uh, <laughs> ironically... That means that they were very, 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 very lucky, though they don't see it that way, unsurprisingly. And they are viewing this as a little bit of a penance. Though, uh, well, the deployment itself isn't necessarily the penance, it's what they're going to do when the Whoremaster, 
I like that name now. I think it shall stick. Eventually arrives on Moloch as they will take, um, quite direct actions in dealing with the whore master and his mongrels. Kind of fits in, doesn't it? Yes, it's a lovely little name. Very fitting, in my opinion. And then, with another sickening jolt of whiplash, we travel back to Terra. Ay, 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 this book jumps like mad, doesn't it? Half of me wants to just, like, make notes and then go through each segment one by one, because they're kind of separate stories all being played out at once, but... I feel like I'd forget half of the things that would be worth noting down if I did so. Anywho, we're back to Loken. He may have uh, failed, quote-unquote, in recruiting the Lunar Wolf Ghost, but he has clearly made up for his uh, recruitment failure in other ways, as he's garnered himself quite the little following of Knights Errant, the eventual Grey Knight. The strike group includes a space wolf, because you can't do cool shit like this without a space wolf, obviously. Loken understands the rules of cool in that regard, at the very least. The strike force also includes Emperor's Children, Ultramarines, World Eaters, etc, etc, etc. Quite the motley little crew of uh, wannabe traitors. <laughs> Well, that's a little bit unfair. Obviously, they have been screened quite thoroughly via psychic means, and on that note as well, the ban on the usage of psychers has apparently been lifted too on Malkador's own warrant. On Malkador's authority. Hmm. Good. Good. And it also justifies the Khan's decision to simply say, no, screw all of this nonsense, I quite like my Storm Seers, thank you very much, so I believe I'm going to keep them. It does, of course, add in a certain element of retardation to the fact that they were banned in the first place. I mean, to be fair, things have changed quite drastically since Nikea, obviously, but if they are recognized as such an effective tool against Chaos and the Great Enemy, which they obviously are, of course, why ban them in the first place, really? I mean, why not maybe just put down, like, um, like an injunction against them, perhaps, and say, like, okay, 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 we're gonna keep doing this stuff, but we're gonna introduce some more rules and legislation, or... Maybe you'd even limit them to certain legions, though that would probably produce a fair bit of rancor as well, to be fair. Hmm. Oh, well. At least Malaghurst has realized the folly of his decision and has reversed it, at the very least so far as his own pet project is concerned. But Malkinor is not the only one recruiting new and interesting types of warriors. Back in the Warmasters Legion, the Lodge is still meeting, and in secrecy too, quote unquote. They're still taking place in the same hidden alcoves, but obviously their need to remain hidden has been uh, somewhat diminished by the whole treachery thing. Still, traditions die hard and all that. And they are about to engage in some dubious moral experiments themselves. Um, Ger Garadan has been rendered an absolute imbecile after a uh, small unfortunate scenario where his body was deprived of oxygen by, yeah, death, essentially, for a little bit too long, leaving the already somewhat mentally challenged Astartes considerably more mentally challenged than he began. And in any other scenario, he would probably just have been allowed to die or uh, euthanized in as humane a manner as possible. But in the modern day Lunar Wolves, um, the Lodge figures that there be a use for him still. 
as the Twisted informs the rest of the Lodge that he has a method through which Ger Garadan will fight again. Though not as the man they knew, he points out, and he also points out that Ger Garadan, the warrior, is of course gone. He is lost to them, but he can be restored in a different fashion. He mentions the... what was it? The uh, the Galvorbach, that was their name, yes. Lorgar's little pets. His demons bound in flesh. And says that Horus, as variant of these monsters, will be the Lupercai, the brothers of the wolf. Hmm. I mean, hey. If you happen to have demonic allies that need to inhabit the flesh of uh, living, but still theoretically no longer useful warriors, I mean, I can't really object to that. <laughs> well, I can object to the demon part, I do suppose, but at least they haven't gotten to the point of Lorgar's Legion, where they're sending their own brothers in to the warp to be the om nom nom snacks of monsters. A slim moral distinction, I know, yet nevertheless, it's something, isn't it? Unfortunately for Malaghurst and his twisted lot, their dabblings in demomancy is not quite as competent as they would like to believe, as the creature they summon is, well, not what they were trying to summon at all. They summon something calling itself Tariq Torgarden. Mm hmm. Loken's old friend. And the character that Loken has apparently been seeing out of the sight, the sight of his eye for a very long time now. He's been apparently spotting his old friend, and his old friend has been speaking to him, even though Loken of course knows that there's no way he could be there, because, well, he's dead. Or is he? Hmm. Always difficult to find that one out, isn't it? Like, are you really dead? Well, I'm in a fantasy universe, so you can really never quite know. I might be dead, or it might be a plot point, much like Loken himself. <laughs> I mean, I can kind of see why he's doubting himself, like, are you actually dead, or are you just me? Fair enough. This creature, however, begins asking some uncomfortable questions. Sixteen captives, that's all you could sacrifice to me? Such a pitiful number. And, uh, Torma, Tormageddon. Tari, goddammit. So many names starting with T. The guy who made the sacrifice, there you go, nice and simple, says that sixteen is a sacred number, don't you understand? And the demon simply asks, to who? Because it's not sacred to the Neverborn, is it? Not sacred to the demons. It's sacred to the Lunar Wolves Legion. Like the demons give two flying shits about that. And so he decides to make it 17. By having the guy that was a moment ago slitting the throats of the poor unfortunate victims slit his own throat, too. <laughs> it's... A good way to make a point, I suppose. It's very difficult to misunderstand that. Like, so, huh, what did the monster intend with this? Probably a warning. Relatively certainly some form of warning. And just as we try to get to grips to what the hell is happening to the War Master's Legion, we're back on Terra again. Criminy. Now, in this occasion, at least, we do get something very interesting, as Malkador is, um, engaged in an audience, I guess we can call it, with the Emperor, a mental one, mind you, as the Emperor is, of course, tied up fighting underneath the palace right now. There's also a, a mention of drawings made by the uh, Ferenzi Polymath, which the Emperor decided were too dangerous for Petrabo to be allowed to see. <laughs> I mean, t he turned out to be right in that regard, but um, it backs up the idea as well that the Emperor was always a 
little bit suspicious of Petrabo, as he told him atop the Astartes Tower that there was nothing half so bad as a unnecessary war. A uh, lesson that Petrabo didn't quite take to heart. Even though he totally said that he did. Oh yes, no daddy, I'll I'll make sure to bear that in mind as I butcher most of my legion. Well, most is a little bit too harsh. He only killed about a third of them by their own hand and then another third or so attacking the black judges. So, you know, not the majority. Uh, anywho, the emperor is engaged in his life or death struggle. Or both, depending upon if you... Uh, Consider being possessed by demons living, I guess, against the monster's hordes beneath the palace, where he also says that we bleed out every day and the demons only grow stronger, which is interesting. Now, it might simply be a reference to the fact that the Emperor can only really fight with his custodial guards down here, and there are limits upon his own power as well, but the thing is, again, the the demons, the great, big, proper demons, were weakening quite significantly, to the point that they even mentioned that they were running out of time when they entreated Erebus. Of course, I suppose it is entirely possible that the little bastard simply lied. You can't really put that past them, but... Again, it feels a little bit like we're trying to make this sound all dramatic here, and it undoubtedly is, but at the same time... Really? The Emperor can't fight a defensive war underneath the palace? Considering the shit he'll pull off eventually... It kind of feels... I don't know. I'm, I'm being pedantic here, by the way, as well. It's like, is, is this really that big of a deal? Well, it is, but it should probably have been worded a little bit more. This needed more of a lead-up, I think. It needed an actual little book showing the Emperor fighting beneath the palace, and also perhaps demonstrating how the gods were uh, feeding off all of the misery and torment and pain and other such nonsense that was being unleashed throughout the galaxy. That would be better, in my opinion. They also have a little talk about who they think might remain loyal and who they think might still turn traitor. The uh, first legion, Astartes, the Dark Angels, Malkador was not at all sure that they would remain loyal and he says as much to the Emperor. Big E, on the other hand, uh, never doubted the Dark Angels at all. They were his first legion and with all the service they rendered him in the early years of the Crusade, there was no way they were ever going to betray him, he says. And I think that a fairly reasonable estimate as well, even even going to the extent, of course, of uh, covering up their own little misdeeds eventually. The first, and the lion, more specifically, they are a loyal legion. It's just that certain members of the legion have uh, different interpretations of loyalty. <laughs> Literally, actually. They're still loyal, they um, are just of the opinion that their loyalty first and foremost should be to Caliban, rather than the Imperium or the Legion. An opinion and a point of view that the Lion will rather famously take a dim view of in the future. The Emperor also mentions that if there is one he still doubts, and no wonders, it is the Khan. Because as he says, the Khan makes a business out of being unknowable. He likes it, he enjoys it, he fosters it and adopts it as a part of his personality, which he certainly does do to an extent. Though, interestingly, the Emperor makes no mention of his disagreement with the Khan. Perhaps because he doesn't think it's relevant right here. Perhaps because he doesn't see it as a disagreement, maybe? Perhaps he doesn't recognize it as the true divide between himself and the Khan. Hmm. Interesting. And 
you know what's up next. Yes, it's a scene change again. And now it's one to make sure that you know that Raven Divine and Lix, his wife and his mother, are all really, really awful people. <laughs> See, I quite like this part of the book, because Raven killed his dad, but you can kind of sympathise with him. After all, his father did refuse to die. An unforgivable sin, obviously. <laughs> oh, heavens. But there was also the mention of his brother. Raven, apparently, had made quite the PR coup of standing in front of a rampaging Malahagra, a monster thing, as it had broken out of its confines and threatened the lives of everyone nearby. Raven had stood in front of the creature with a broken, unpowered power sword. He was facing down the beast, seemingly to protect his brother, and a pick had been snapped of this and spread every malware, making Raven famous. Even though it was his father that actually killed the creature, he didn't get a whole lot of the credit for the bravery. Unfortunately, this is where the uh, adorableness ends rather abruptly, as Raven, his wife Lix and their mother, are ascending a tower where they are keeping Albard, Raven's older brother, prisoner so they can harvest his blood and torture him frequently, as they have a deep-seated and absolute hatred for the man that isn't really explained at all. I guess it's just, you know, succession envy, maybe, because Raven's the younger brother and he always wanted to be the boss man. I guess uh, there's a mention of some family strife, but... I mean, they really hate this bastard. They have a whole conversation on the steps up to the tower, thinking to themselves, Oh, I hope he's lucid, so we can tell him we killed his dad. Okay. Rightio then. There's also a whole scene describing his mother as this absolute monstrosity. Apparently she has the ability to see the future, so a witch then, and she has embraced rejuvenate treatments to the point that she has two blinded servants following her around with vat, with tanks of vat-grown rejuvenants harvested from babies, mind you. Uh, I just, okay, right, right, bad people. I get it. Really bad people. And it also makes you sympathize a bit with Albert as well, which is another excellent little trap. I do like a lot of the little writing narratives in the book. It's just, again, kind of too bad that a lot of it is, well, I've got one book to do this and I've got this awesome idea, so we've kind of got to crank on with it. And on the note of cranking on with it, I think we will wrap up part one there. This is probably a three-parter, if not even possibly a four-parter, as it really is filled with some rather interesting little tidbits here and there. Anywho, till next time, I have been Arch, thank you all very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Till then, have a good day.